Dear everyone, uh, welcome to Master Ulf Holbrook's doctoral dissertation on this Friday, the 29th of April, 2022. On the 28th of November, 2021, um, Ulf Holbrook submitted a thesis entitled Objects and Structures, Aesthetical Inquiry and Artistic Experimentation into the relationships between sound objects and spatial audio and presented it for the degree of Philosophia Doctor of this university. On the, um, on the recommendation of the Department of Musicology, uh, the Faculty of Humanities appointed the following evaluation committee. Professor Natasha Barrett from the Norwegian Academy of Music, Professor Marcel Kobusen from Leiden University in the Netherlands, and Professor Peter Edwards at the University of Oslo, Department of Musicology. Professor Edwards served as the coordinator of the committee. On the 11th of February, 2022, the evaluation committee reported that it had found the thesis worthy of being defended at a disputation for the degree of Philosophia Doctor. Today's proceedings will start with a prescribed trial lecture on the following topic. How theories developed by Schaeffer and Schaeffer influence current day technological application and artistic thought illustrated through examples from recent artistic work. I now call upon the doctoral candidate, Ulf Holbrook, uh, to give his trial lecture. The floor and the screen are yours. Thank, Thank you, Zafar. Hello, everyone. Thank, Thank you for, for coming. coming. My name is Ulf Holbrook, and I'll be talking a little bit today about how the theory is developed by Pierre Schaeffer, the French composer and music theorist, and the Canadian composer and theorist Raymond Murray Schaeffer, and their subsequent influence on the development of music, technological applications until today. The theories developed will be briefly presented, along with some historical context, before moving on to unravel how these theories had influenced subsequent generations of composers and sound artists and technologists, knowingly or unknowingly. Tracing the influence of these theories, tracing the influence these theories might have had on subsequent generations of artists and thinkers is difficult, as methods and technologies can often be spread on the internet and in underground networks without reference to the origins of the theories. Pierre Schaeffer was a French music theorist, composer and engineer. After having been involved in the resistance movement during the Second World War, he worked in the studios at the Radio Diffusion Française, where he later set up the Groupe de Recherche Musicale, still known today as the DRM. Here are some pictures of the boys and their toys in their studio. He and Pierre Henry conducted a long series of experiments with the technologies available in the studios, and Schaeffer's musical experimentations led to what he called musique concrète, music made from concrete, real-world sounds. Central to Schaeffer's music theory was the attention to subjective listening as a primary method of analysis of sound, and the development of the concepts of the l'objet sonore, or the sound object. This will no doubt be discussed later today. Here I will play two short excerpts which illustrate the concerns in the early days of musique concrète.
The sound object is a, or theorized as a fragment of sound, listened to repeatedly to access the sound's feature. Schaffer and colleagues arrived at this realization after listening repeatedly to short samples on closed groove phonographic discs, also called Sirion Femme. After a time, they experienced a shift in attention away from the everyday significations and the events of the sounds and towards the sonic features of what they heard. Many of these early experiments are recorded in Schaffer's book, In Search of a Concrete Music. Schaffer's experiments in the studio has become a de facto method for composers following in his steps and traditions. The use of the studio as a compositional element of this new type of music has also been reflected in Brian Eno's 1979 lecture, The Studio as a Compositional Tool, where he does not mention Pierre Schaeffer, but still echoes many of the concerns of electroacoustic composers and cites many of the innovations in the field of popular music production. This perspective has also been presented or represented in German music software manufacturer Ableton from 2016, the side where the important contributions by Schaeffer, Henri, Daphne Oram, Delia Derbyshire, and many others are made available and evident for new generations of music producers and makers. That being said, the influence of Schaeffer's approach to musical sampling can be said to reach far outside of what is conventionally known as art music. Also, it influenced George Martin and his studio experiments with the Beatles, the hip-hop producers such as DJ Cool Herc, Grandmaster Flash, and Public Enemy, through the multitude of sonic experiments and chops made by Matmos, through their own recordings of plastics, old instruments, and liposuction machines, as exemplified by the track Interior with Billiard Balls and Synthetic Fats from 2019 release Plastic Anniversary. electroacoustic music was not entirely new. It was preceded by Walter Brechtman's radio play, Weekend, from 1930, uh, which was an audio portrait of Berlin on a summer's day, or an Egyptian composer, Halim el Dab's The Expression of the Tsar, from 1944, one of the earliest known pieces of tape. Weekend was in itself an extraordinary foreshadowing of musique concrète and soundscape composition. Here are two short excerpts from these pieces. Hallo, Fräulein. Bitte Döner auf 4440. Erlkönig. Ich bleib, bitte, bitte. Bitte. Wir reiten zu spät durch Nacht und Wind. Es ist ja... Fräulein, Sie haben mich... Theoretician R. Murray Schaefer formed the World Soundscape Project at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, Canada in the 1960s. Part of his motivation was a fight against industrial and urban noise, which he claimed would lead to a universal deafness. The World Soundscape Project recorded local sound environments and in later years made recordings across Canada as well as in Western Europe. The lasting contributions of Schaefer and his students Barry Truax and Hildegard Westerkamp 
was what later became acoustic ecology, the scholarly, artistic and political approaches to studying the relationships between sound and environment. Here is a short example from the 1973 album, The Vancouver Soundscape. Schaefer was not the first to use the term soundscape, but was the first to theorize around the term and unpack most of its meaning. Jonathan Stern has recognized that other influences on Schaefer's work and the use of the term soundscape comes from 1950s hi-fi culture. Schaefer uses the same terminologies as in hi-fi magazines, where a good hi-fi system and correct position of speakers could recreate or create a soundscape in your living room. Also, the term was drawn from Michael Southworth. 1969 essay, The Sonic Environment of Cities, where he uses the term soundscape to explain how sounds influence the perception of the visible city. A central concept in Schaefer's soundscape is schizophonia, or in his methods, which is defined as the split between an original sound and its electroacoustical transmission or reproduction. This refers to the sounds that have been split from their sources as we experience them on radio, TV, MP3, or any other recording media. The World Soundscape Project not only set out to record and document the changing Canadian soundscape, but they also engaged in research and acoustic measurements around several cities, developing a strong methodology through acoustic ecology, as exemplified from these two plots. The first which shows a sound event plot, and the second an Isabel map. The sound event plot was an attempt to measure sounds from, a, from one location and try to identify all the different sounds that would appear within a certain period of time and their sound pressure. An Isabel map shows variations in sound pressure over a given area over a given time. As a continuation of the World Soundscape Project, Barry Truax and Hildegard Westerkamp introduced soundscape composition, which in turn was heavily critiqued by Schaefer. Schaefer's critique of, the sound of soundscape composition was due in part to the traditions of electroacoustic music being transferred to environmental sound and to the soundscape. And composers used environmental sounds solely as material and stripped it of its meaning and context. Many composers who call what they do soundscape composition do so merely because it uses environmental sound, but it does not create any kind of relationship to the soundscape. Common for both Schaeffer and Schaeffer's work was an insistence on listening as a primary method and a tool for understanding. And both theories and their subsequent composers and theorists have inspired and influenced often sites as a primary concern in their work. Under these practices, Hildegard Westerkamp pioneered soundwalks, a central technique in engaging with the soundscape. A soundwalk is defined as any excursion whose main purpose is to listen to the environment and exposing our ears to any sound around us, no matter where we are. Her most noted work is that of Kitch Beach Soundwalk from 1989, where she records a scene on Kitch Beach in Vancouver, Canada, and explains the sound scene to the listener and proceeds to demonstrate the uses of audio technologies to manipulate how we hear the soundscape. But I'm trying to listen to those tiny sounds in more detail now. Suddenly, the background sound of the city seems louder again. It interferes with my listening. It occupies all acoustic space, and I can't hear the barnacles in all their tininess. It seems too much effort to filter the city out. Luckily, we have bandpass filters and equalizers. We can just go into the studio and get rid of the city. Pretend it's not there. Westerkamp's narration of the scene and the process echoes much of the ideas expressed by Brian Eno in his 1979 lecture on the studio as a compositional tool. 
After introducing the place, the relationship between her position, the sea, and the city, she plays with the technological mediation of the sound and demonstrates methods of sound manipulation to remind the listener that we are hearing is processed, recorded, transformed, mixed, and presented by a human. Simon Emerson has described this as a zoom lens, a process where the real filters of electronic technology are used to enhance the psychological filters of perception. Sandwalks have also become very popular among many artists working, are also popular among artists working with soundscape and field recordings. But it's also been explored by many visual artists, among them Canadian artists Janet Cardiff and George Burns Miller. For example, here in this short video from Nightwalk for Edinburgh from 2019. There are moments when you go out of sync with yourself, when you feel that you don't know the person inside his body that you're walking with. But you have to keep coming back, retracing your steps, like slowly climbing the stairs. And then you can find yourself again. Around to the right. Up here. B and B. Be nice to have a drink. Maybe later. That looks like my red coat. The one that I lost. Last time I wore it was late one night in Berlin. I remember coming home. A young man was lying drunk on the sidewalk. He only had one shoe on. What you doing? She's left something in the mouth. History leans by dark entry with words from his mouth that say pity me, pity me, but never forgive. Let's go into this close where she went. Here, you're walking the streets of Edinburgh, following a video shot in the same streets as you're walking. This is part game playing, part surrealist poetry, perhaps even a murder mystery. It's layered with history, invention and memories. You listen to a narration by the artist, you follow instructions, you hear the recorded soundscape of the city from when it was recorded, and you've experienced the soundscape as you are present. The composer Knut Olof Sundus, 2018 piece Himdalm, is presented as land music, but is also part sound, where four musicians and 12 loudspeakers are placed out in the terrain in Himdalm, a small, unpopulated valley uh, which houses Norway's only repository for radioactive waste. With a duration of 13 hours, the experience of the work out in the landscape seeks to mirror the difficulties of comprehending the long half-life of radioactive waste, which could stretch from seconds to decades to millions of years. During the performance, the audience has to navigate the landscape in the dark to locate and piece together the different musical elements in minus 10 degree weather towards the end of November 2018. The storage facility this piece is written around will be in active maintenance until 2030, and after this will be under administrative supervision for 300 to 500 years. This work mirrors both the concerns of the soundscape, its site-specific, and its exploration of the music and the landscape. Here is a one-minute excerpt from a one-hour-long documentation video of the 13-hour-long performance.
10 degrees in the forest is kind of baffling. Sandwalks have been further developed by Christina Kubisch as electrical walks. Here, the public can listen on special custom-made headphones to the hidden electromagnetic waves around us. These are made both as interactive maps and also as physical sandwalks, where an audience can walk the streets listening to electromagnetic emissions from the surrounding city. Kubisch notes that, quote, Oslo is the Norwegian capital and a European city in which digital services, public internet, RFID identification, surveillance cameras, fluorescent lighting, radar systems, anti-theft security devices, surveillance cameras, mobile phones, tram cables, antennae, navigation systems, minibanks and neon advertising are used intensively. Payments are almost no longer made in cash or with cards. Many doors do not open with keys or with codes. Apps substitute conventional services. Internet is available everywhere. The increasing digital communication is connected to an increase of electromagnetic fields all over the city. End quote. Of other artists active today, the concerns of the soundscape and the environment is still actively researched, documented, and exhibited. Acoustic ecology is central to Australian sound artist, composer, and researcher Lee Barclay's work which focuses on complex sonic environments and draw attention to the fragile ecosystems as a means to inform, among others, scientists through methods of acoustic ecology. Her work is realized through live performances, installations, and site-specific interventions. Among them are also sound books. The Norwegian sound artist Elin Lister and her project Soundscape Rust from 2010 to 2020 examines the changing soundscape of the small island of Rust outside Lofoten in the north of Norway as affected by climate change, loss of biodiversity, social political issues surrounding pollution and industrialization. The sound artist and composer Alexander Rieselk uses the Norwegian landscape of the north and its post-industrial soundscape. And he wants to investigate how we as humans relate to public space and the sound environment around us, collective auditory memory, and how sound functions as a phenomenon, a social and political construct. Another example can be found in Melissa Pond's work, especially from the release Swedish Forest Textures, which documents an old forest in Sweden shortly before being logged. Here is a short excerpt.
Still today, the studio-defined practices from the early days of musique conquête are used. For example, in the work of French composer Lionel Marchetti, who creates traditional, quote-unquote, musique conquête, through a multitude of tape techniques, but also uses synthesizers and synthetic sources. As here in Plantos from 2020, And again, again in La Muira from 2021. 2021. These traditions, techniques, and methods are still widespread and prevalent among such performers and composers as Helena Gao, Philip Jack, Christian Markley, Jerome Nottinger, Diemo Schwartz, among many others. Here is a short excerpt from Helena Gao's album, Not in Variance, from 2016. The British act Altecker and Apex Twin, both legendary in their respective fields, cite GRM composer Bernard Parmigiani as a major influence in their music. Down to the side, you can also see a program from an Acusmonium concert in San Fidele Musica from Milan in 2012, featuring a program of music by Altecker, Apex Twin, and Parmigiani on the same bill. I'll play three short examples, and I'll leave you to fight amongst yourselves to decide on which example belongs to which performer. In Robert Hampson's uh, Réfercation from 2012, commissioned by the GRM, classic acousmatic treatment of sound materials can be traced, heavily influenced by Bernard Parmigiani and François Bale's work. Hampson has a background from rock band Loop, experimental drone guitar band Main, but also in industrial metal band God. American composer, sound designer and performer Richard Devine 
explicitly demonstrates the influence and importance of Parmigiani's work by interpreting and being inspired, of course, by the part incidences and resonances from the 1978s De Natura Sonora. In this video, he's using a Eurac synth module, the Mutable Instruments Elements Modal Synthesizer. These experiments bring the world of musique concrète and acousmatic music, as developed from the early days of the GRM, out and into the world of Eurorack modular synths and current trends and practices of live electronics and electronic music. As soon as somebody like Richard Devine posts a video like this, the internet catches fire and quote unquote everyone wants to be part of the action. Probably, and likely due to the book Treatise on Musical Objects not being made available in English until very recently, Many people have been inspired and influenced by Schaeffer's theories through the music of other composers, as for example, Bernard Parmigiani. In one sense, you can come for the music, but you can stay for the theory. Other composers and work from the GRM are given continued relevance today, as for example, through the continued releases of music from the GRM archives, through a collaboration between the labels Editions Mego and the GRM but also thanks to such imprints as Australian label Room 40, as with the recent release of Beatrice Ferreira's work, for example here in her piece Lotto Rive from 2007. We cannot necessarily trace the influence Schaeffer and Schaeffer might have had on artistic thought and practice today. But we can possibly better trace this through the influences of the composers who worked with them. For example, in the practice at the GRM from the 1960s to the 1980s, that continue to have a, um, uh, an influence on new generations of composers and artists. The richness of Schaeffer and Schaeffer's theories are not only examined and explored through the various artistic practices found today, a few of which have been discussed here, but these theories are also used in, for example, applications in computational detection and analysis through an upcoming toolbox, Des Objets Sonores, developed by Olivier Latilio and others. This takes an important step away from much research in music information retrieval by not focusing on transcription of music into notes in a classical sense, but in the classification of feature categories based on the tipper morphology. And as such, it reflects Schaeffer's project very well in that, in that we should attune to sounds and their subjective perceptions and not seek to notate music through abstract symbols. In ecoacoustics research, which is drawn out of bioacoustics, the soundscape is part of what is called the vibroscape. That is, the entire set of vibrations present in a specific portion of a geographic area. 
and the soundscape is part of the viberscape that is perceived by an organism. See this way, the soundscape is defined by species and by organism. Here also, soundscape is defined as the acoustic component of a landscape and is further subdivided into sonotope, soundtope, sonotone, and soundtope. The vibroscape, in one sense, is made available to us through Christina Kubic's electric walks, where we can access parts of the spectrum which normally is not available to us. In examining a cold protected forest, Greenfeeder and colleagues have used acoustic logging over one year to assess the natural sound, how the natural soundscape is changing through documenting the biophony, the sounds of birds and animals, the geophony, the sounds of wind, rain, etc., and anthropophony, human related sounds. These figures on this side show the uses of the C Wave R package, which provides a wealth of tools for researchers to measure thousands of recordings. This toolset has been further developed as Scikit MAAD on the other side, as a Python library for quantitative soundscape analysis. These technological developments can be traced directly back to the earlier practices in acoustic ecology through both Sound Event and Isabel, as presented earlier. With an ever greater expanding technologies as long term, low cost, soundscape monitoring is possible, as well as more precise analysis of the subsequent recordings. The research on natural sound can be pushed even further than Schaefer and colleagues could have imagined in the 1970s. For example, through the inexpensive acoustic logger audio, which allows scientists and others to do long-term recordings for monitoring of biodiversity and the environment. This device records up to 384 kilohertz, which means you can record bats and other species which communicate in the ultrasonic domain. This is a vast improvement to the bulky and heavy tape recorders that people lugged around during the World Soundscape Project in the 1970s. The availability of these low-cost devices also prompt artists and researchers to share code with others, as for example here with some screenshots from Nathan Wolick's GitHub page where it demonstrates its bash scripts for processing large amounts of sound files captured on the audio. The term soundscape is used in a variety of research where sound is a focus. For example, in Duarte and colleagues' work on noise pollution in the oceans of the world, and not to mention the influences the work of Bernie Krauss and Gordon Hefton has had on both artists concerned with the soundscape and field recording but also to researchers examining the effects of noise pollution and climate change on the natural world. The incredible diversity of artistic and research fields around today could perhaps have been possible without the contributions of Schaeffer and Schaeffer. But it's no doubt to be that the practices these theories have inspired will be almost impossible to quantify. As these theories, or the practices these theories have, have inspired, will continue to grow, the far-reaching implications of these contributions are almost impossible to quantify. And with that, I will thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for your uh, lecture, Ruth. Uh, we will now take a one, uh, one hour and 15 minute lunch break and the proceedings will continue at 12.15. Enjoy your break.
I forgot, I forgot to, to turn, turn on, on the, the, um, the microphone. microphone. Um, um, now, now the candidate, the candidate, candidate is, is to, to defend, defend his, his thesis, thesis in public. public. Uh, uh, the, the first, first uh, uh, opponent in the disputation will be Professor, Professor Natasha Barrett, Barrett and the and second the opponent, opponent, Professor Marcel Kobusen. Um, if, if anyone, anyone uh, wishes, wishes to speak, to speak as, as an opponent ex auditorio, uh, please uh, let, let me know before, before the second opponent is called upon to speak. speak. And, and may I ask everyone, everyone to please turn off your mobile, mobile phones. phones. Um, I now call upon uh, the doctoral the candidate, candidate Wilf Holbrook, to come, to come forward, forward and, and give, give his, his introduction. introduction. The floor so and the screen are yours. Thank you, Thank Zephyr. You, Zephyr. Welcome, Welcome back. back. This, this thesis, thesis is, is about, about sound, sound in space. space. It is and an exploration, exploration of sound in spaces, spaces between, between sound, sound objects, objects and, and spatial, spatial audio, audio systems. systems. This thesis, this thesis examines Pierre Schaeffer's concepts of the sound objects as presented in his 1966 book on music theory, The Tree Trees of Musical Objects, objects an, essay an essay across the system. system. And it attempts to provide a suggested extension for how we can use the theories on the sound object in the domains of spatial audio. The thesis is divided into three main parts. After an introduction, which presents background materials and methodologies, it covers, in chapter two, objects, understood as units of perception, of auditory objects, and as a means to access the features of sound. In chapter three, structures are examined as an organizing principle which describes describe both the perceived structure, structure and the activity, the activity of perception, perception and a set of relational, relational properties in space. space. The fourth, fourth chapter discusses the typomorphology, a complex, complex and powerful and framework, framework developed by Schaeffer for the description, the description and classification of sounds. sounds. I, will I will return, return to these three parts shortly. Short. This, this project, project started out with a very, very strong, strong technical, technical focus, focus. Focused, focused on software, software development and technical applications of spatial audio. However, However, as time, time has progressed, progressed, it became more and more, and more clear that a that discursive framework, framework for the development, development practice, and uses of spatial audio, audio became more important. The concluding, the concluding remarks in the thesis, thesis notes that the future work will be based on this thesis, thesis will include continued software software development of libraries for spatial sound, sound. as well as, as, well as the technical development of the exten suggested, suggested extensions of the tip morphology. The following the research, research question, question has been formulated, formulated for this project. project. How, can How can we extend, extend the theories the theory of the sound object to include spatial thinking and practice that engages with ideas of sight and landscape? Along with this, two further sub-questions are defined, which are stated as, to what extent can we build upon or extend Pierre Schaeffer's typomorphology to discuss and describe spatial attributes? And to what extent can we use the discourse bounded to maps, mapping, sight, landscape, surface, shape, and object to continue to frame a discourse around the practice of spatial composition from artistic, aesthetic, philosophical, technical, and practice-based perspectives? So to introduce, this thesis rests on two methodological approaches. First is the axis between analysis and synthesis. This has previously been written extensively by Jean-Claude Risset, and his approach and research of the uses of computer synthesis and the modeling of brass and bell sounds. This describes a process of systematic exploration of features and is a method to understand the world by breaking it into smaller parts and looking at the possible interactions between the parts and their surroundings. Risset referred to this as analysis by synthesis, but in this thesis, this is shortened to analysis synthesis to emphasize that analysis and synthesis are two separate processes. Secondly, this thesis rests on practice as research, where the creative exploration is a pathway to where new insights, knowledge, and understandings can come into existence. The program and methodology described by Schaeffer for musical research had at its center an insistence on listening as repeated musical experimentation. These processes were explored through technology and mechanical manipulation of recorded sound matter, 
with the end goal of achieving deeper and wider understanding of the sounds that were the basis of musical creation. Michael Schwab has introduced the concept of a transposition, which has been of particular importance in regards to practice-based research. This is a means to show how something changes its identity when moving across different instances. A transposition does not merely describe operations within artistic research practice. It is also an, quote, operation with artistic research. That is, artistic research emergent as a transposition of a project, a speculation on how else knowledge can be gain, gained, and what, knowledge, what notions of knowledge, and perhaps even art, are suitable to capture a project's achievements, end quote. At the heart of Schaeffer's project was the question, what are we hearing? As a basis for where all investigations should start. In part two of the thesis, objects are discussed for the perspectives of the intrinsic and the extrinsic features of sound. Specifically, the discussions on the object lead to the sound object and the theories presented by Pierre Schaeffer. This part also looks into model, other models of perception, such as events, streams, along with discussions on perceptions of shapes and surfaces. Different models and approaches to listening are covered and aims to provide an overview of the different perspectives. At the heart of this research project is the sound object, as it was formulated by Pierre Schaeffer. This is defined as a fragment of sound suitable for study in and of itself. These studies by Schaeffer and other co-workers were based on listening to recorded fragments of sound and the perceptual images evoked through uh, listening. These perceptual images are influenced by our individual listening schemas and also our intentional focus during listening, i.e. where and how we direct our focus. In this project, an expansion of the sound object structure or composition is proposed. This is proposed to consist of three interrelated parts of a shape, a sight, and a model. The shape refers to the sound's intrinsic qualities, its amplitude profile, its spectrum, etc. The sight is a reference to the extrinsic relationship contained in the object. It's reference to an external sight or location. And the model refers to how we choose to analyze and synthesize the object. This intrinsic-extrinsic link draws on what Dennis Smalley has referred to as source bonding. He acknowledged that music is a cultural construct, quote, and an extrinsic foundation in culture is necessary so that the intrinsic can have meaning. The intrinsic and extrinsic are interactive, end quote. In this sense, the intrinsic carried with, carries with it a reference to the extrinsic, and source bonding represents this intrinsic-extrinsic link of how listeners will tend to relate sounds to a supposed source or cause. The different modes and models of listening, of shapes and their relationships to surfaces, are analyzed from a perspective of space. In part three, structures, this examines the context of objects through the notion of the structure, the contextual features of sounds and space through listening and landscape. The chapter discusses possible ideas of the sound landscape through the place bound and the site specific. Different approaches to spatialization are discussed along with aspects of psychoacoustics. The structure is used as an organizing principle and as an activity of perception. The objects we interact with or the objects we experience are perceived as objects within a structure and these are contextualized through the complex interactions between sounds and spaces. In this chapter, this interaction has been brought under the heading of the sound landscape, a term borrowed from Trevor Wishart, and, uses, and is used to discuss the apparent and imagined source of the acousmatic, loudspeaker-mediated sounds through the metaphor of a landscape. Structure seeks to examine possible relationships among objects and the multiplicity of interactions among them. Questions around space and spatial perception are explored through ideas of site-specific art, which became widespread in the visual arts in the 1960s. The landscape denotes an external world, a structural feature that is mediated through subjective experience. This externalization is important because first, it relates what we experience to something out there, that is, our, uh, that is outside of our heads and belonging to the world around us. The sound landscape has been used rather than the more popular term soundscape that was discussed in the previous presentation because the soundscape often refers directly to field recording practices, environmental sound, and the double nature of the uses of the term can be ambiguous 
where on the one side it can refer to the research carried out to the 1960s and 70s and is still much in use today, and to the uses of soundscape composition where the environmental sounds are purely sounding matter to be manipulated by an artist. The sound landscape is used as an interface towards incorporating ideas of place and into the site-specific on the discussion surrounding the, surrounding the sound object and its uses in composition, sound design, sound installations, and research. Place is defined as what is lived in our daily lives and draws on Henry Lefebvre in considering place to be where everyday life is situated. And space represents, quote, the flows of capital, money, commodities, and information. Place is shaped by the grounding of these material flows, end quote. When discussing the site-specific, I draw on Miwon Kwon's work. She has offered one of the most comprehensive discussions, genealogies, and overviews of site-specific practices in the visual arts, where it is arguably much more sophisticated. These are broken into three categories. Of one, phenomenological site-specificity, which responds to the physical realities of the space in which the work is encountered. Two, institutional site-specificity goes beyond the space itself and considers the agency of the place where the work is experienced. In Kwon's term, this is the gallery or museum, but it could relate to any space. And three, to discursive site specificity, which goes beyond the institution and looks at site as a product of intersecting narratives, debates, and practices. This engagement with site, with landscape, and with place is an attempt to take the considerations on the possibilities and potentials of how spatial sound images can be designed and given to a wider context. This insistence on the place bound and the site specific is a means to avoid the point in space paradigm, which is prevalent in spatial audio applications. To design spatial sound images, we have to consider the spatial identity of the sound, what it is doing in space, what its behavior is, and how these different considerations lead to the conclusion that images are not points because they have a size and a dimension, and they can, operate, they can occupy space in different ways. The final part, Chapter 4 looks at Schaeffer's typomorphological framework as he described it in his book, The Treatise on Musical Objects, and proposes possible ways this can be used as a system for a multidimensional model for spatial practice. Based on the two preceding chapters, Chapter 4 discusses spatial process, processes and effects by examining approaches to ambisonics and amplitude panning, as well as timbre and mapping functions. This chapter also presents five different case studies that consist of an approach to acoustic simulation in a virtual reality project, and artistic projects evolving around sound design for theater, compositions, sound installations, and sound spatialization for an exhibition venue. The typomorphology is a tool for investigation. It is not a table of results. The general purpose is to move forwards in a set of approximations rather than in a straight line. This is also emphasized through approaches to analysis by synthesis, as described earlier. The purpose of the typomorphology and the classifications of sounds is always, what are we hearing? In order to gain knowledge about what we are listening to, analysis, and to use this in approximating something we are moving towards in synthesis. The typology is a first sorting according to the overall shape of the sound and the morphology looks at the internal characteristics and features of the sound object. The tasks of the typ morphology are identification, classification, and description. The morphology, is divided, um, the morphology is divided into seven criteria of mass, dynamic, harmonic timbre, melodic profile, mass profile, gain, allure, and the aim of the tip morphology is not to identify abstract values such as pitch classes, but rather to classify and to understand sound in its possible diversity. In context to this, five case studies are presented towards the end of chapter four. The first case study, entitled Tessellation Rift, describes a process of experimental sound design, which sought to explore an idiomatic approach to ambisonic sound images. These experiments were explored through Schwab's idea of a transposition, especially where the experimental context was created for the sake of gaining knowledge about several instances in the project. In short, it was trying to make and know derived from practical investigation. 
These experiments also led to a finished piece of composed music, which has been performed at numerous festivals and conferences internationally. Case study number two, stochastic spatialization for hot pockets, discusses an approach to using stochastic methods for spatializing sound for an exhibition by Turi Vormes at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Oslo in 2017. During inspiration from Yanis Sanakis' approach to dynamic stochastic synthesis, random walks were used as a method for making sound move around the exhibition venue in unpredictable ways, causing an ever-changing sound sonic impression of the space. The stochastic motions were read sequentially through, from a data table through a step sequence. The stochastic distributions introduce a flexibility in spatializing sound, as an increase in step size can cause the data to become much more randomly distributed, allowing the user to, quote unquote, tune the trajectories of the exhibition venue. This first implementation has been documented in an article presented at NIME conference in 2018. Keystone number three, entitled Superimposed Landscape Lista, presents and discusses a sound installation made as part of a jury group show at Lista Fyr in the south of Norway in June to September 2019. This was presented as an eight-channel 2D ambisonic setup where the premise for the installation was to, quote unquote, recreate the surrounding landscape inside the exhibition space in real time. This was achieved by placing microphones inside and outside the exhibition space and sampling and playing back the sounds. The experiences gained from being on site in the landscape working on this project prompted the development of the spatial concerns surrounding site-specific art presented in chapter three. Again, this case study demonstrated to me this is a making and knowing derived from practical investigation. Case study number four, City Dwellers 2, was a collaborative project with poet and playwright Tala Ness as part of her PhD in artistic research at the National Academy of Arts in Oslo from her project called From 1 to 100, the performative hybrid text as a feedback loop. City Dwellers 2 was conceived as a city portrait heavily inspired by Wim Wenders' 1987 film, Wings of Desire. This city is undefined, but exists as a structural metaphor to encapsulate the different voices contained in the city. The audience came into the room, met this installation slash performance as a series of white 3D printed houses, different rows throughout the room. Each house contained a small iPod and a speaker. As each voice sounds, a white light flashes inside the house, directing the audience's visual attention in that direction. My contributions to this project was to create some kind of a multi-channel encapsulating sound design that will create a boundary layer and a texture to, make, to tie the audience and the houses together as a kind of sense of creating some kind of physicality in the room to surround the audience. When considering the installation slash performance as a city space, its presence rests on the experience of a sense of place and how this is lived. We consider the structure of place to be of importance because social practice is place-bound. Place is the moment when the conceived, the perceived, and the lived attain a structured coherence. This room starts out as an empty space and is gradually filled with voice fragments synthesizing a new social space. It's case study five. Music in the Interactive Space, with a collaboration with Johannes Lunde Hatfield at the Norwegian Academy of Music. Uh, it is uh, conceived as a VR learning lab. It was focused on the uses of technology and pedagogy through the use of virtual reality for teaching, performance and practice preparations for music students. The project explores the possibilities of performance enhancing training for students through virtual reality and multi-channel audio. The project was sadly never completed due to delays in the VR simulation development. And unfortunately, a rather large pandemic also came in the way. Although we have plans to resume the pro some work on this project later this year. The project's aim was to establish and develop a learning laboratory in which music students can improve on their instrumental practice and performance preparation. Music students will practice up to 7,800 hours throughout a five year study course. Most of this time is spent alone in a practice room, which can also contribute to stress when faced with a concert or audition situation. We set up a small lab in the academy with a 12-channel sound playback system, 
where the students could experience different concert perf uh, performance situations, from waiting in a green room, you can see down here, to performing on a 360 degree stage modeled after the Elbe Philharmonie in Hamburg, down here, um, or to a smaller uh, Viennese concert hall, as well as to um, audition situation in the two separate spaces. The lab was set up in August 2018, and the first round of audio-only experiments were run in October the same year with 13 participants. The lab was set up so that each performer was seated or standing, depending on instrument, in the listening area, surrounded by speakers, and were wearing a virtual reality headset. A microphone was installed on the instrument and is used as the main interface from where students play through the simulation. The concluding remarks in the thesis notes a series of technological software projects as an avenue for future work. A rewriting of software presented in case studies two and five among them, as well as developments of computational methods for spatial synthesis drawing on the tip of morphology. It is my hope that this thesis can contribute to a wider awareness of the uses and discourses around spatial audio for the future. Um, we will now <clears throat> take a short break and continue at one o'clock. Welcome back, everyone. Um, I would like to thank um, the candidate, Ruth Holbrook, uh, for the introduction, and uh, also ask the first opponent, uh, Professor Natasha Barrett, to please uh, continue with the proceedings. The floor and the screen are yours. Thank you. Oof. Thank you first for uh, the PhD thesis. Um, and also for the trial lecture, which, as we have all heard, uh, was successful, as we all experienced, was successful. Um, I have a number of questions for you. Um, but first, I'd like to uh, address um, a general question. Okay. Um, and mm -hmm. this is about the integration of the sound object and the environment. Now, in Chapter 2, you discuss the intrinsic features that make up our cognition of objects through the models of listening proposed by Schiffer and Xion, and through the soundscape listening of Schiffer, Tuax and Westerkamp, to the real-world listening of Norman and the ecological acoustics of Garver. Now, many people would see Schiffer as a world detached from Schiffer and Garver, yet as you present them in the context of listening in Chapter 2, and have indeed created were artworks that draw these theories together into one artistic output, you are trying to show how they can be reconciled. Now, indeed, you're placing your works also in a context that's outdoors or in a public space. And in that respect, we also can't ignore the work of James Gibson and his theory of invariance, which are the constants underlying the continuous modulation of the sensory array as one moves from place to place and how form is progressively disclosed until we see the world from everywhere at once. 
And as we move, we hear acoustic reflections change, which, of course, is important in your work, uh, and these reflections resonating and diffracting through structures which inform us of this meshwork. So what I would like you to do in a, a general way, first of all, and then we have a few specific examples, is to summarise in a few words how these qualities, which can be seen as opposites from Schaeffer and Schaeffer and Garver, and indeed Gibson, are integrated in your title, The Aesthetics and Experiments of Sound Objects and Spatial Audio. <clears throat> well... <laughs> you, can be, you can be general, first of all, and then we can sort of uh, engage in a discussion on it if it's too uh, big a task to do at the outset now. Well, I think it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a very, it's a very big question, and it kind of covers, uh, it kind of addresses so many different aspects of the thesis kind of in and of itself. Um, I think perhaps the guiding um, ideas for me to organize it or to kind of to make these claims in this manner is that the way the listening models and the way like the artistic and perception models that are organized both by Schaefer, by Norman and Gaver, they respond to a different type of sound perception than what it does in Pierre Schaeffer. Mm -hmm. So when he theorizes the sound object is this small item of sound that is isolated and then is listened to. So Schaefer also uh, responded to the sound object saying if you record a sound, you bring it into the studio or to the lab, you listen to it, it's an object. If you listen to it outdoors, it's something else. And I think those, that, is like the, that is the primary motivation for me to rest solely on Schaeffer's concept of the sound object because it is something you isolate and it's something you study regardless and kind of like outside of the environment or the events where it took place. So, would you say it would be true to say that your um, approach to Schiffer is more from a compositorial and artistic perspective as the creator, and your approach to, for example, Garver, uh, Gibson, Norman, Schiffer is to do with the placement of the work in the public space and the reception of that. You also mentioned Natier, of course, in your chapter, um, mm -hmm. and the tripartition. Um, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> or as I would uh, usually say to my students, it depends. Um, I think, at least to my mind, I've not necessarily, or perhaps not intentionally, um, consider these other kind of listening models and like practical models to be of that big of an importance. Of course it is, but I've primarily been interested in how this kind of pretty complex theory on the sound object can become something more than merely being the study of sound fragments and how we can extend it to be outside of this, and how we can use that within these kind of artistic contexts and within research contexts, etc. Um, as I note, I think in the third chapter, there's, um, although I've dismissed the, um, the event perspective mm. in favor of the object, mm. the event is still important because it's how you temporally understand and perceive the sound as it happens either in the outdoors or within a concert, exhibition setting, etc. Mm. Although I don't think I've explicitly anywhere actually said that I kind of like rest my, rest my case on Gaver or anything. It's like I think they've all made um, exceedingly important contributions to the way it kind of like this whole discourse is framed and perhaps I'm a little bit influenced them by them in the subconscious rather than in the conscious kind of sense. Mm. Um, to dig a little bit more into this then, and also to ask if you can uh, give a, a, an example from one of your uh, case studies. Um, the connection between what we have discussed and uh, the spatial audio side, in that um, it's much easier for us to reconcile the idea of spatial audio when it comes to Garver and Gibson and 
that environmental context because it is something we are inherently embedded in as opposed to the theories of Schiffer, which we can extrapolate spatially, of course, and we can elaborate and develop in a spatial direction, but per se, it's very uh, much um, a detachment of that um, environmental awareness. And of course, again, in your works, you are some way reconciling them because you're working in, with abstract sounds, but putting them in a, an environmental spatial context. Um, but could you maybe elaborate a little bit more on that connection, so seeing how Schaefer and say, Garver actually come together in an example from one of your pieces. I think perhaps the most, um, the most, excuse me, um, one of the best examples perhaps would be to the, from the third case study, which looks at the um, stone installation in the south of Norway. It's, <clears throat> set out with this idea to engage with the landscape, with the, engage with the surrounding space, um, only through sound. Mm. And then the way this was realized was that I built a software sampler, put microphones out into the landscape. It sampled sound continuously in real time from fragments of from two seconds to one minute, I think, or one and a half minutes. Brought this back in and looped it and played it back into the space. So in a sense, it was this attempt to kind of go into the landscape, bring the sounds back in, and then represent a kind of version of the landscape within the exhibition hall, within the exhibition room. Which ended up not being a gallery, but was a bunker from the Second World War. So it was like this kind of, it was kind of already part of the landscape in a sense. It's kind of like cut into, cut into the land. And I think the, the, kind of maybe the way that the, that project would reconcile these ideas is because it takes small fragments of sound and then loops it back. So you could sit in the room and listen to these like sound objects kind of repeatedly, as in the kind of like traditional musique enquête um, um, study fashions from the studio. But at the same time, it tries to bring these sounds and the, the perception of this sound closer to some kind of a perception of the environment, some perception of the landscape, the actual place where you're kind of moving from. So the audience would then walk across a hill, down into a slope, and then into the bunker, and then back out. And you would always hear the environmental sound at the same time as you were hearing um, the sampled recorded sound in the space. Um, I refer to this as, I use uh, one of Xion's terms of the acousmètre, saying that there's this outside protagonist that is hidden, which is, of course, the sound of the landscape. So the waves crashing on the shore, uh, the birds, other people, then kind of is fed into the room when you're there listening to it. So in a sense, it kind of brings together both these um, ideas, both from um, the sound object and from the environment. Mm. So you would say that when people enter the bunker, they will be listening to the sounds that they are familiar with in a different way from an acousmatic perspective, detached from the causation, or how would you expect them to then actually understand what's happening when they get into the bunker? Ah, it's difficult. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> kind of like the, the, the premise for the project um, or like my ideas at least for the project, was of course that the, the audience should be able to recognize the sounds they heard as being something coming from the landscape. Mm. The nature of the space itself changed that because it's a bunker, it's the floor and the seats are made of concrete. There's a curved ceiling made of rusty corrugated steel. So any sound you play into the room is going to be completely distorted by it. Um, but at the same time, I, I just kind of I maintained and just kept those the same kind of like motivations in the project. And I, when I listen to the documentation, you can very clearly hear um, sounds that are recognizable as organic environmental sounds, mm -hmm. because there's no there's no kind of like manipulation or transformation of the sounds apart from what the acoustics of the space mm -hmm. will do to it. Yeah. yeah, and indeed, some sounds will maintain their. Uh, reference more clearly than others. Yep. For example, seagulls will be much clearer than yep. the crashing of the waves, which will turn more into a noise-based yep. yep. uh, morphology. Mm. Um, uh, so still sort of digging a little bit more into Schiffer and the connection we can make, actually, mm -hmm. to ecological listening. And um, 
I was wondering what your opinion was on Schaeffer's uh, concept of attunement. And that we are not always correctly attuned, even though the information which is where novels' perception arises uh, is available for everybody to pick it up if they are attuned to pick up that information. Does that sort of ring true to any of your artistic work? The idea of attunement. It's not something I've discussed, nor I think particularly considered. Um, I think I've looked away from that kind of one thing because I've, I've placed a lot of emphasis on um, Schaeffer's kind of percept or not perception, but his, um, his insistence upon intentionality, mm. which means how you choose to direct your focus, which is also where my, what can I say, the primary motivation or the primary like insight that I had to be able to kind of support, uh, to, um, what's the word? Suggest an expansion of the sound object. Exactly, because there's, there's such a multitude of, of uh, perceptions that are possible within one sound object. And when you choose to change <coughs> your intentional focus to what you're listening to, that in itself is enough, I think, to be able to use the sound object in this kind mm. of like the mm. spatial sense, to be able to expand it out from just the pure like musical listening. Could you elaborate that in a spatial context? Because we are talking about a thesis that's based on spatiality. Mm -hmm. Do you mean from one of my case studies or just in any example. kind of mm. example? Mm. Um, I think it permeates everything in this sense. So a good example would be hmm. um, I think one of, perhaps an example that I can make is from the work that led to what is case study number one, mm. where it started out with a, with, a, with a motivation to try to find out, I, was, I had this like, long, very, very interesting discussion with um, Joseph Anderson from DX mm. Arts about like, the sound field, about points, about kind of like depth and perspective and listening. And I was like trying to connect these things to like kind of being in the environment and how you hear, the, hear, how you hear sounds from a distance. And I was approaching this from like this synthetic point of view. So I was taking individual impulses, just clicks, simple points in space, and then trying to like tease out of them if there's a way that they can become like spatially present. Mm -hmm. We can create textures of a background and then points and like musical tones, sounds of some sort that can exist on the, on the foreground. And then I spent a lot of time just generating sounds, listening to them in multi-channel settings, trying to understand and trying to listen into if it's possible to make any kind of like assumptions of like, how does this exist spatially? How does this occupy space? Is there some kind of dimensionality to this sound or the way the sound is made? And then listen to this next to, for example, environmental sound like a recording made with a sound field microphone decoded and then played back over the same kind of loudspeaker setting. So is there some kind of a change? Is there some kind of a mm. perspectival change or difference between the two ways of listening? Mm, okay. Uh, actually, that now leads me on to a more specific question. Thank you for your elaborations. Um, and I'd like to get onto the idea of gate, because you mentioned gate quite a lot, um, also in connection to your... Oh. Stochastic spatialization. Now, gate in Schaeffer's type of morphological framework is about the identity imbued for the behavior of the sound. And so, for Schaeffer, the gate comes from the sounds. Now, the sounds are not random, and they are imbued of a rich, intrinsic identity. Um, but in Hot Pocket, we are <coughs> using stochastic spatialization, and stochastic by Definition per se doesn't have an identity. So can you elaborate a little bit on what you're actually uh, trying to achieve with what you call unpredictable gate of a sound over N loudspeakers, to quote the, mm -hmm. from the Hot Pocket, actually in terms of gate, which 
from the typomorphological morphological framework has an identity due to the fact that Schaefer was using acoustic sources which are rich and unique. And although we're not understanding the sound for its identity in the way of association, which he wanted to remove us from, he was interested in us understanding an identity which was mm-hmm. uh, unique and clear rather than one thing sounding the same as the other. So if you could sort of elaborate on why you chose a stochastic approach to spatialization rather than some other kind of way of creating a gate through motion behavior. Well, the case study uh, in number two, the stochastic spatialization, is a really old project. It was in 2017, and I didn't yeah. even know better. Mm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed it was, it was I was, uh, I was, um, I was uh, heartily still clinging on to this idea that I had of kind of these algorithmic, automatic type of systems uh, to do spatialization. However, I have, when I've been looking, you know, kind of looking at it in retrospect, and kind of like as I've been starting work on like trying to reformulate it and reprogram it and like try to make some new versions of it, um, I still think that, and I, and I, and of course, I, I don't know this for sure. I will, I will find out as I continue to work on it that the motions that you can create with the sounds, or the, the way you can make the sounds move through space, correspond to what he described as gate or as allure because he refers to it as an undulating movement or fluctuation of sound object Mm. or described as an oscillation. Mm. So I've taken that maybe he refers specifically to the morphological, the features of the sound itself. But then in my kind of like attempt to like draw this out from just being purely about the sounds, Mm trying to like bring this into like this kind of a spatial context. Mm, mm. No, I mean, absolutely. Of course, this, they, is, yeah. this is post-conceptualized. Of course, like I mm. did the project and then I've been trying to bring this in to see like, is there something here that we can use or continue to use mm. within this context? Yeah. No, I think, the, of course, the idea of gate with Schiffer and Allure is absolutely a spatial, uh, can be extrapolated spatially very easily. My question was more about the the framework of how that motion is defined um, and the use of stochastic processes mm-hmm. as opposed to some kind of process which more defines an identity, which of course might be in keeping with the environmental space you put it in. Again, mm-hmm. it's another connection then between Schaefer and Garver because mm-hmm. then you would take um, an intrinsic spatial gate and place it in an environment that has a connection to it or it connects to and they reflect on each other because they are put on site in a certain way. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, in some ways that comes out with the random walk in the uh, museum because you have designed something which is in keeping with the space in the museum. You've had to put speakers in certain places. It's been uh, controlled by the framework of the space and, of course, the collaboration with the visual artist. Um, you know, so it has a framework there. Yeah. And so, again, I'm sort of digging, trying to dig into this connection between uh, intrinsic gate and the extrinsic environment that the work is placed. Um, yes, yes. Um, interesting. Okay, that was more, that was more of a, a, a sort of an observation. No, no, but I, I think, I think, <laughs> yes, I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm trying to process. Just, um, hmm. I'll come back to that. Okay. Um, going to dig a bore into the type of morphological framework. And um, in the, the famous Bible of musical yes, objects. Yes, I saw you brought the Bible. That makes yes, me, I thought it makes I, me very happy. It's an yes, a important book, I think, for both of us, particularly as neither of us had very good French. And it was only when this book was published in English that we really could read deeply to Schiffer rather than rely on other people's translations of selective sections. But I would like you to discuss a little bit this figure, which I'm going to show. Oh, and I, you probably can't see it because I don't have a screen. Um, this one, about his balanced uh, objects. Now, um, OK, so all the aspects of the typological, uh, typomorphological um, framework, Schaefer lays out in a, in a little 2D figure where there's everything can happen. And in the middle, though, there are what he calls balanced objects, which are the best things to use. Now, what I'd like you to discuss is um, how our listening and our technology has changed this 
sort of demography of what is regarded as balanced and whether it's still true or not, or whether because anything goes, there are no longer the no-go areas that Schaefer puts around the outside of this figure. Can you, I mean, I have my own opinion about this, but I'm not going to you know, see to the discussion. I'd like you to discuss a little bit from this, because, of course, I know you've gone deeply into the um, framework <laughs> from uh, but this But I, uh, I, don't, I don't think that his balanced and unbalanced... Uh, as say, uh, as, at the same time, also his, his concept of the suitable and the unsuitable objects. Mm. I don't think that those are relevant, because... The way we use sounds now, the, the way that we kind of interact and engage with it has changed completely since he wrote the book in 1966. Mm -hmm. um, he might have been appalled by the direction that things have moved now, where like anything can be used, um, regardless of length, or regardless of listening situation or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I still think those are, there, there, are, there are many aspects in his book, and in, of course in the Bible, that we should just, that we should kind of perhaps not disregard but we can just kind of pass over in silence in a sense mm. because there's already within his ideas on the object the reduction to the object the ways we listen the way we can like interact with materials with technologies the way we classify the topology the way we analyze in the morphology is already such an incredibly rich system that gives you so many opportunities mm. and possibilities that if you then start to say like well you're not allowed to do this or you're mm. not allowed to use that mm. sound, then you, all of a sudden you start to take away important mm. artistic expressions, but also in terms of pedagogy, how you would teach these kind of things, how you would actually be able to use his music theory to teach students, which I think is kind of a travesty that it hasn't really been taught that much up through the years. That's generally my, that's kind of my, mm. my mm. main... Um, well, Part of this. Would you say that um, a figure like that, where uh, Schiffer lays out in the middle the balanced objects, and these are the, the materials we should use, mm -hmm. would you say that we can actually look at that now from a different perspective when it comes to um, ecological and natural listening on one hand, compared to the artistic process on the other? Mm -hmm. So it's again really coming back to your Natier type partition, and that the anything goes on the artistic process. Mm -hmm. But do you think from the natural listening and from the environment and from the Garver, the Gibson, the uh, World Soundscape Project, all that other stuff, which is all about sound in situ in place and our perception and interaction of that, actually there is still that balanced objects section in the centre? Or do you think that that is actually no more relevant, isn't, isn't relevant anymore? So you're thinking from the listening perspective rather than from the creative side? It could be. It could be. I haven't actually, have actually thought about that, to be honest. It could be that there's a relevance for that. But I still don't really know if Schaeffer's contribution of a balanced object would mm -hmm. have any relevance towards those fields, towards mm -hmm. environmentalism. Okay. Because it, as with everything, it kind of comes back down to intentionality. Like, mm. what, it is, what is it that you're focusing on? What is it you're listening to? Mm. The question, what am I hearing? Um, and I think it comes down to your intention for listening and your intention for engaging in the process you're engaging in. So whether you're an artist interested in soundscape composition, if you're a researcher involved mm. in ecoacoustics, there's, there's a broad span, and I don't... Mm. I, yeah. Yeah. I, so you, so you, you would sort of move away from the postulation from Gibson that the environment is structured and there isn't anything you can do about it. Perhaps. Mm. Okay. I'm sad to say. <laughs> um, but I think, there's a, I, think there's a, I think there's a pretty big difference between the, the, way, we in, the way we interact with environmental sound in terms of soundscape composition, in terms of ecoacoustics, and the way it's done, and the way we interact with it in terms of the more traditional acoustic mm, music. And absolutely. I think that I think your the focus, your intention, everything is very different. So I think perhaps for an acoustic composer, perhaps working in these fields, thinking that well, the, the environment is the way it is, you know, screw that, I don't have to care about it, I can do mm. whatever I want. Mm. But then for somebody researching the environment, the environmental structures are of course extremely important to be aware of and to know how to function in order to make some kind of objective or 
subjective, objective decisions about what the sounds are and what kind of, what kind of influence they have. What does it mean when an airplane crosses over a, um, a, a wildlife reserve? How does that influence kind of the species that live in this kind of forest area, for example? As a composer, you can just like, throw that out the window, mm. depending on your intentional focus, of course. Depends on the intention, yes. Mm, okay. Um, okay, I'm going to jump on out of Gibson <laughs> and back into the intrinsic. Now, um, in a few sections, you uh, actually, from the beginning, you talk about ex intrinsic and extrinsic. And um, you also uh, mentioned uh, in your uh, presentation now, your summary of the thesis, um, and connects this to Smalley. And I believe the first term was coined by Smalley in the acousmatic context, uh, in terms of intrinsic and extrinsic. Um, but I do wonder if this has jumped over a little bit quickly uh, in some sections of the thesis. And one of the things that was jumped over was the connection between intrinsic, extrinsic, and surrogacy. And that you, but you point to this in your summary at the end of the book, or end of the thesis, by quoting Smalley's discussion on Chowning's work, Turenas, where the uh, extrinsic, intrinsic link uh, is precisely what Smalley would call the remote surrogacy projected into the listening imagination through motion behaviour of sounds. So I was wondering if you could elaborate on this intrinsic moving into extrinsic through the level of surrogacy. Because this is something that Smalley, he, he's in his 80s paper when he first elaborated spectral morphology, there was this sort of uncomfortable mm -hmm. layout, really, of extrinsic, intrinsic, and then the different levels of surrogacy, which, I'm, of course, you're very familiar with. So could you sort of um, discuss how you understand that in the context of your work and whether the idea of remote surrogacy is something that can transform your intrinsic world of Schiffer into the extrinsic world of your installations without moving into real-world sounds or real-world recordings. Have I, made, I don't know if I've made that question clear enough. Please ask if you want something clarified. Um, I could add a little bit to help you. Um, you talk about external uh, determinants, or in other words, the connection to the site in which the work is placed. Mm -hmm. And that could be thought of as a level of surrogacy. I've never really thought about it that way, to be honest. How would you well, reflect on that now? Always, always yes. Smalley, Smalley's idea of surrogacy, mm. really, I've... It's not, I don't think it's mentioned anymore. I don't think, I've, I think uh, perhaps I've just uh, glossed over it <laughs> somehow. Um, I think the, the, criti the critique that I pose of Smalley is that he, when he wrote about it in his first paper, he had troubles understanding Tyrannus. Mm. And I, I think I make some kind of a claim that he's having trouble understanding it because the title doesn't give him some kind of an indication of a direction to, to understand it. And the sounds are completely synthesized, so they're divorced from his normal tradition of acousmatic music. Mm. Um, I think Tyrannus, for example, is a, is a wonderful example of like, this like, spatial presence of sounds because it explores the way sound can move through space, how it can create a space, and with that, like all these... Uh, the imaginings that you can have when you're listening to it and experiencing it spatially. That is what, it, what I'm drawing the, the connection to this, this piece of how it responds to some kind of like an externalized event mm. uh, or externalized sight in that sense. Um, I think I'm, I'm, I, I, somewhere in the thesis I write about that space is important because it provides us with some kind of like an externalization. It's not just about like the space between two speakers or the space between the notes or the space around the tone. It is how you physically experience it spatially. Um, perhaps that is one of the reasons why I really haven't kind of gone into his idea of, this, of, this, of the surrogacy. And I'm just thinking like the, the intrinsic properties of the sound and the way that it exists extrinsically mm. and the way the, the, those two elements are connected together in the way you perceive the sound physically and spatially. Mm. 
I think that is the answer I have to give. Yeah, yeah. Because I think that uh, um, when you look at uh, Smalley's discussion of challenging his work, you can actually see this as um, turn it around in a positive way to see this as the uh, extreme example of remote surrogacy as a spatial experience. And then if you then track through what remote surrogacy actually is, and uh, finding that as another way to reconcile the difference between the intrinsic object of Schiffer yeah. and the extrinsic world around us, which we you know, commonly understand as the reality of the yeah. world. Um, there could be some mileage there to, to maybe dig into that into the future. Absolutely. Um, Yes, okay. Um, let me see. I think I would like to sort of um, ask a little bit about technology. And that's why um, I'm here, isn't it? First question I have really is about the listening situation as the composer creator, in that when we are working with very high order ambisonics or wafer synthesis indeed, who uh, recreate accurate spatial perceptions for us in the creative environment, um, we do not have the capacity or the possibility to sit working every day in a high-density loudspeaker array. And of course, we're working with binaural emulations a lot of the time, or working with a reduced set of loudspeakers in horizontal, maybe. Um, can you talk a little bit about your creative process during your case studies, and how the availability of the monitoring situation, maybe led your research in certain directions? Well, I was, I've been extremely fortunate in that regard. For the first two years, I think, or a year and a half, as part of the, the project, I had access to our lab with a 47-channel speaker setup. Um, as we moved up here to Ritmo, there was issues with, the, with our lab and the way they were set up. So I was able to use the Notam studio with 24 speakers in a kind of hemisphere setup. So I was in this absolutely opportune, extremely privileged position of being able to sit and work on loudspeakers, small loudspeakers or headphones in the office at home in my own studio and then come into this room and then be able to mm. kind of project things spatially in order to evaluate, to listen, to spend five full days in a, like a 24 channel studio is pretty, it's like a huge privilege when it comes to being able to spatially understand what it is that I'm trying to achieve. Mm. And sometimes you know, you're not always sure what it is you're trying to achieve and it's impossible to kind of like understand that. First time, for example, I did, I worked in Andersonics, I had done something in full 3D. It was performed in a 2D setup, so like, half of the piece was gone because like as soon as something panned across the audience it was just like it wasn't reproduced of the loudspeakers so it made like some um, made some very kind of like hard life experiences mm. in like different settings so having this access to these studios has made all the difference in terms of that the way that i'd be able to craft that kind of understanding mm. and luckily the no time studio is just a short bike ride from here so i could easily go there mm. kind of whenever needed in that sense yeah, so that's uh, a great advantage, of course, in the uh, research context, uh, as well as the artistic investigation. And um, what do you think you lose when you then put those works in a situation where you do not have those facilities? And I mean, I know, of course, the um, context that you've been performing in, and they are far from mm -hmm. the 47 speakers of yep. the Qubit, uh, uh, the university, or No Time Studio. And, of course, you know, as artists, we understand things will be lost. But I'm wondering if you can now sort of connect yourself from the artistic, you as the composer, <laughs> and what you lose in comparison to what you have uh, elaborated through your research and how those things actually then can connect and what we actually keep. In terms of space, of course, because we're <laughs> talking about space. <laughs> yeah, 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 of course. Um... Well, in terms, of, in terms of the case studies, um, the way, well, the reason all the case studies are in the thesis is because all five of them have had different effects on the way that I think about space. Yeah. Right. So, for example, the case studies number three and four, superimposed landscapes, the installation, and city dwellers, collaboration with Tallinn 
Initially, I hadn't planned on actually including that work in the thesis because it was like some kind of a separate work. But because the experience of being present in the space, the experiences of making, as I say, making and doing as a source of knowing, it became so completely entwined with the research, the way that I started to understand sound, the way I understood space, and the way those things could be exploited, it became such an integral part of the research process. Um, the five case studies kind of like discuss this and like treat this in very, really different ways. Mm -hmm. um, and I think th those are all like five kind of possible ways of like exploring the space. So for example, stochastic spatialization for Hot Pocket, yes, I directed the technicians where they should install all the loudspeakers and how the room should then be covered with sound in a sense. But then I sat at home programming these like, kind of like the way these trajectories would move and then like come into the room only a few days before the opening to be able to audition it because there's like there's this time that you don't have available to be in the mm. space, etc. Um, in terms of composed work, so case study number one, yes, I had access to a large studio and I could kind of like sit and like fine tune every single little kind of speck of sound mm. within it. And the other things, you come into a space, you have three days to get set up, get something working the experience of doing it, the results, and like the, the conclusions you can draw from it will mm. be pretty different. But the, the experience will be different, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the approach to space mm. is kind of wrong in any way, or that it's like it has, um, what am I trying to say? What I'm saying is that the, the experiences are different, and it gives you different perspectives on how you can treat and how you can work with space. Well, would you say that your research leads your um, investigation of how you can compromise the work in a public space where you have less, less loudspeakers and a public where you are expecting them to move around and they're not in the ideal listening position which you had in the lab? Or would you say that it more is a way of, okay, I've done my research and now I need to eke the best out of my piece from an artistic object? I mean, both you know, composers take both approaches, and I'm wondering where you feel that you land. It's a jumble of everything. <laughs> In that sense. Um, I think my experience is working with other artists, doing, uh, doing, uh, like, doing spatial programming for them. Um, working in a lab, doing, working with other artists in the lab, working in different studios. I think the experiences that I've, that I've learned is that it doesn't actually matter the, kind of like the, the opportune situation that you wish to have. You kind mm. of have to go into this like spatial context and deal with what you have available. Mm. So a bunker from the Second World War made of concrete and steel sounds really different from a theater stage. Mm. So then you have to, like, then you have to try mm. to work with those two different spatial environments. Mm. And of course, doing sound design and like trying to like create some kind of like a spatial texture so that an audience would direct not their attention to what they're hearing from the back, but towards these like, individual voices in these white 3D printed houses spread around the room. It's extremely difficult to be able to make something when you don't have any audience members in the room. Exactly. We yes. just kind of have to like, okay, how does this mm. work? Mm. Sometimes it works, yeah. sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. And in this instance, it was good because we can then tune the way this worked over the course of several days. Um, well, we're getting on with time, so I think I'm going to um, focus on one last question. Um, and I'll try to keep it within a framework <laughs> rather than let it expand too far. And that is um, the use of reverberation. Now, um, when you're putting works in spaces, of course you've got the uh, real propagation of the sound in the space. You have the real reflections. If it's outdoors, you have one context, of course. If you're in the bunker, it's another context, and so forth. Um, and that is a real space that people attach to. It cannot be thought of as intrinsic in any way. It is a part of their living space, the place. Um, in some of your spatial emulations, you, for example, use the FDN reverb. Um, now, this plugin has a special flavour that sounds like the plugin of the FDN reverb. And so, in some ways, what is, could be thought of as being 
an intrinsic approach actually isn't. It's an extrinsic because mm -hmm. people hear an artificial reverb. It has now become extrinsic. Mm -hmm. It is no longer intrinsic. But then you're discussing it, though, from an intrinsic spatial mm -hmm. point of view. And I think I would like you to uh, explain that, really, uh, whether you have con considered that the use of these types of reverbs are in themselves extrinsic because we are so familiar to hearing artificial reverb. We think, mm, artificial reverb. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, rather than, for example, using an impulse response, which in itself could then be much more intrinsic <laughs> because it becomes more natural and we don't listen out for it anymore. It becomes an, a part of our whole scene, which could be uh, sound objects which are intrinsic and feel together, and we're not pointing towards, ah, reverb extrinsic, because mm -hmm. I hear the artificial reverb. Yep, yep. I think in the first case study, the FDN reverb is used as... It ended up being used as a way to create some kind of like a spatial texture. Instead of doing like a granularization, <clears throat> building some kind of granular cloud, I found that this kind of to build some kind of a density around the listening area mm. um, using the reverb because it has this, it has a very kind of granular quality when you just play really mm. simple things through it when it kind of like rings for a long time. But for this case study or like within those, those experiments I was doing, the, the reverb and like the densities that it created allowed me to really effectively place then smaller individual sound objects on top of it. Mm. And I used it as a means, or like the, the, the way at least I was experimenting with it was to try to create kind of a depth and a perspective of the sound. So within like a completely artificial mm. sound environment, because it's only, everything is just impulse based. Um, there is one patch, I think, included that was discussed in the uh, section called uh, 4.3. Where I use an FDN reverb. Um, that was based on experiments with taking, actually, there were some experiments that date back quite a long time, but it was a kind of a way of taking like the individual sound objects and then splitting them in like in, in different portions of space, depending on their like the, the, the way the early and the later reflections are emulated through the reverb. Mm -hmm. uh, not then to say like, okay, we'll have like the original sound here and then a reverb in the back to create some kind of a texture. It was more this like kind of motivation of trying to split the sound <coughs> by reverb yeah. in, in like covering a space. Yes, that's the decorrelation network. I think you're talking yes, about. Yes, page one hundred and forty-eight. Yes, exactly. I'm just wondering why you then went over to the FDN reverb rather than continuing the exploration of the decorrelation network, which you can control yourself because yeah. it's in Max or yeah. PD Max. Yeah. Uh, just you know, thinking about why then go over to the FDN plugin from IEM when you have this control in Max, where you mm -hmm. can uh, really dig into it as a sound processing device in space, yep. rather than hmm, a reverb. Mm -hmm. I don't quite know why I favor one over the other, to be honest, um, on standing foot. But I think probably the reason why I used the, uh, the, the FDN reverb plugin from the IEM suite was more that I just, I just wanted this like texture. OK. And it wasn't so much in a way of like trying to control um, kind of like more the character of it. So, so would you say that so you were testing out tools? Because I see you also went, moved into SPAT at one point. Um, were you sort of trying out the available software and yeah. seeing what they offered? Yeah. And then you decided, okay, I'm going to use SPAT for this because it's yeah. given me this. Okay. I've used every single Amazonic library that's available yeah, I think, yeah. throughout the course of this to try yeah. to, because they all have, they all, well, they all have, they all mm. have different qualities. Mm, mm. And of course, because I primarily use Max MSP, that is probably the most comprehensive there is, although kind of with its certain drawbacks. But um, yeah, I think that's kind of ended up being like the de facto tool that mm, I've used mm. for many of these experiments. Mm. Okay. Um, I think that probably, yeah, I think that concludes my questions. Thank you for your answers. Great questions, thank you. And um, yes, I will wrap that up there. Okay.
thank you very much uh, for an exciting and interesting dialogue. Um, uh, let's take a 15-minute um, break and we come back um, at 2 o'clock again. Thank you very much. And if, um, if there's anyone who wishes to speak um, ex auditorio, please let me know. Welcome back, everyone. I would like to now call upon Professor Marcel uh, Kabusen, second opponent, to start, uh, continue with the proceedings. The floor and the screen are yours. in somebody's life. Um, yeah, okay. But you heard me, uh, so I don't have to repeat it. Um, well, in case you, you haven't read the thesis yet, um, here are four reasons to start with why I think you should. Um, first of all, uh, Ulf expands and rethinks, as we heard already before also, Pierre Schiffer's ideas on the sound object and connects them to spatial design as an integral part of the creative process. So, rethinking and expanding Schiffer's ideas. Um, he also rethinks space in relation to sound and through sound, and thereby also emphasizing spatiality in sound. Uh, the third reason why you should read it is because he, uh, or the thesis, contains critical reflections, not only on Schaeffer, but also on Schaeffer, on people that are very close to my area of research, uh, Seth Kim Cohen, Brian Kane, uh, and all these critical reflections, I think they are very much necessary for a PhD thesis. Um, and the fourth reason why you should take notice of this thesis is that it contains, as you have heard, five case studies which shed a light on the use of ambisonics in music and sound art, uh, which are, uh, I find, very interesting pieces to listen and watch. So, um, having said that, um, I have some minor questions. The first one might sound a bit odd, but uh, I have actually two questions which, which are connected to the um, title of your thesis. That's why I asked uh, to present this slide again. Um, actually, um, I'm, I'm interested in, in the word and. Um, because that suggests, um, on the one hand, a connection, and on the other hand, a separation. So, are you now referring to the 
Typo or yes. subtype? Yeah, to objects and structures. So the word and is for me the interesting word here. So as I said, it both connects and separates. Um, and let me focus a little bit on, on the separation. So, according to you, or if I understand you correctly, um, the sound object consists of intrinsic and extrinsic features. And the latter, so the extrinsic features, are defined as, among others, interactions with the environment. On the other hand, you define structures on page 4. I must admit that's on the PDF version, so not the, the printed version, but uh, I heard from Peter that it's almost the same. It should be the same. Um, so on page 4 you define structures as relational properties. Separated and my question, one sub-question would be if that separation is an ontological separation or an epistemological separation or an experiential separation. Anyways, they are separated from the object. Now, I had some difficulties in following this division, especially when you are referring to ecology and the philosophy of, for example, they are mentioned briefly, but nevertheless, the philosophy of Karen Barat and Martin Heidegger. So, if, as you put on page 47, if the existence of one agent depends on other agents, how then can you separate the object uh, from the structure? Or, to put it differently, the structure cannot be reduced to space and interactions cannot be reduced to the objects. And besides, uh, ecology often refers to the interaction and mutual emergence of beings and their environment. In that sense, the focus would not be on beings and objects, but on becomings. So, my first question actually would be, can you reflect on this word and, um, and how you would defend to separate the object and the structure in relation to um, your um, exploration and thinking in terms of ecology and the philosophy of Heidegger and Barat. <clears throat> wow, yes. Um, first of all, I don't really think that there is a separation in the thesis between an object and a structure. It's true that I've written that the structure represents a relational, what is it, a relational um, property. Um, the reason that these are discussed in two separate chapters and there's an and between them, I guess the and between object and structures refers to that there are two separate chapters in that sense. But I've drawn on this to see that a structure is viewed as a structure of the object that comprises it. And an object is never seen as a separate entity as it is part of a structure. Um, the reason, for example, that I've drawn in Martin Heidegger's work from his uh, Sein und Zeit into this is because he makes this realization that so much of our um, perception of the world around us is made in the unconscious. So I draw in this as a, a, this, this feature that I'm discussing to see that the way that we would listen, and break down and isolate things into individual objects allows us access to certain features of the sound. But then as we get access to them, they still remain part of this kind of the general structure from where we take them out of. I've used the structure as this kind of like, I, I call it relational properties because this gives, or at least I've, I've found that it gives me the opportunity to then take um, the sound objects and the spatial audio component of it, the spatial relationships and the spatial kind of existence of this, and then bring that much further into, for example, then the site-specific art that I've discussed in chapter three. 
And I'm interested in these, like, these relational qualities of what happens with sound. How it, does it create space? How does it create place? What is our perception of this? How do we understand it? How do we perceive these things? So there is a separation, yes, in that it's a necessary separation that you have to remove an object from its context, from its structure, in order to listen to it, to understand it, to make some kind of perceptual judgments about it. But then it's always part of that structure. That's why I'm saying the object contains the intrinsic and the extrinsic because it always belongs to this structure. There is always this contextual relationship. The strength in Shafir's work is that through reduced listening, you direct your intentional focus to specific features of the sound that you want to listen to. That could be its morphological criteria, it could be the, the space where it comes from, it could be what kind of existence the object has, the way you would listen into it and direct your intentional focus. As you once you kind of step out of like the reduced listening situation, the object still then remains into its context. Um, yeah, um, just, just to come back to this reduced listening, um, you, you write on page 38 that sound or the sound object can be, I quote, temporarily removed from the context. And coming back again to this, let's say, ecological philosophy, um, it would seem almost impossible to do that, uh, to take that even temporarily out of context. There's, I mean, there's always the context. And uh, coming back again, um, I mean, an object, again, according to these philosophies, can only come into existence in and through the relations that, so that, that creates, so the object doesn't precede the relations that uh, it is entangled in. Um, so it, it is defined by its relations and thereby it comes into existence. So um, again, if, if you say you can take it out of a context or um, you, 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 you indeed say, well, okay, it... it um, well, for, for me, it's still not clear if you, if you make that... If, if you make that, if you take all the consequences of, of what you're thinking on the one hand, so, so on the one hand you say, okay, you rely on Schaeffer with a sound object, which in his thinking is still possible, perhaps, to, to take it out of a context, to isolate it somehow. Whereas when you go to the ecological thinking, and, um, well, you're, you're flirting with it at least, uh, more than uh, uh, there, it becomes very problematic mm -hmm. to 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 think. Okay, this is something an an an, an object, indeed an object, uh, which which I can take and and you know I, I can do many things with it. But that changes immediately the object, so it is not the same object anymore. So how is that with this reduced listening then? Uh, just for one thing, or to rephrase it and to come back to what I asked before, um, if you can do that at all, um, to, to somehow make this separation between object and environment or structure, is that, according to you, an ontological idea, or is it an epistemological idea, or is it an experiential idea that you're presenting here? I would have to say it's the first, I guess. The ontological? Yes. I think... That makes it even more interesting. <sighs> yes, I was afraid of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think... One of... Um, One of these principles, for example, rests on what, um, what is his name? 
um, Graham Harmon has written about, about Martin Heidegger. And he writes about the perception of objects. And he talks about how an object comes into existence once you, kind of once you perceive it. Like things happen in the unconscious. It's only when things start to function as we normally would kind of expect them to do that it comes into like your conscious being. He also writes something about how in, in Heidegger's work, there's this <laughs> idea that objects belong to this like murky realm. You don't actually have direct access to them. But like they, they step out and you get access to them and then they kind of retreat back into this realm once you've kind of stopped using them in a sense. Once you've stopped interacting with them. Um, I think one of my primary motivations around this has been that taking Schaeffer's ideas on reduced listening and how you reduce the way to the object to gain understanding and knowledge of something by trying to isolate it from its context, I think still is possible, even, in, like, even with an ecological perspective. It might be to kind of like to swear in the house of God in order to separate something from its context. But I still think the reason it is so the reason it is valid and the reason that it has strength is because you temporarily suspend your ideas about what this is in order to access its features. It's not a permanent state of something. Of course, with new knowledge comes new insights and of course it changes the object, but then it changes the object only after you perceive kind of its components. Do you understand? Yeah, yeah I, I, I try my best at least. <laughs> um, so, so do you, are you acquainted with uh, Heidegger has at a certain moment, he, he writes somewhere, A is A. And, and by, by that he wants, to, he wants to, to prove the failure of mathematics. <laughs> because, because it's very simple, A is A. That, yeah, I mean, everyone who's studied, I mean, his first grade uh, mathematics, they, they know like, uh, that, that is true. But he says no. And exactly because of spatiality, he says, yeah, but this, this A equals A is at another space there. So it's not the same anymore. So he's already in, in his work. So I think that Graham misunderstands Heidegger. Um, and why is that? Because when Graham, but also still Heidegger as well, are talking about object, they are thinking too much from the visual and not enough from the sonic. Hmm. Because a sound cannot not relate mm -hmm. to its environment as you make clear throughout your whole thesis. It is also, I think, um, in terms of the, the, the different spaces between the two A's, of course, or the different spaces they occupy is also it, kind of one of the things that I kind of try to bring into this is Xi'an's perspective that all perception is egocentric. So you, everything you perceive, you perceive from your own stand, from your own position, whether it's a physical position or if it's a kind of like a conceptual scholarly position. So when you listen to sounds in space, if you listen on a spatial audio setup, if you're seated in the center or to the sides, your perception of that space is different between the two positions. And I think that also is kind of like, that, that's this plays into the way that I'm conceiving of these like relational properties of how like spaces then start to kind of like bind these objects together into this new structure that you have. But then your perception of it is different depending on where you're positioned. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That, that is, uh, that's good. Yesterday uh, during my, uh, my present short presentation uh, here, um, I, I said that what actually uh, these guys like Graham and, and Karen Brat and many others, are after is a change from egocentrism to ecocentrism, mm -hmm. um, where not the human being is at the center. Um, as, as you, so it's not only talking from your position, but is aware that you are, are also positioned by the space in which you are acting. Yeah. So you are as dependent on all the other agents and environments that are playing a role there in your situatedness as that you are situated per se. 
I'm not entirely sure that I agree that it's, that it's not egocentric. Um, I think because no, no matter the space or no matter like the, the environment that you're perceiving in, you're still perceiving it from yourself, from like your own like physical mm. body and your own location. Mm. Um, although, I'm not sure. <laughs> there's, there's, this, there's this interesting link both in the way that Harman and others are like both treating Kant and, and Heidegger saying like it's, it's like it's an attempt to move away from like an anthropomorphism that like everything is established and evaluated and analyzed from a human perspective. But like, I can't like, I've discussed with Thomas Nagel, I can't like understand what perception is for some other being. You know, it's like, I only know what human perception is. I don't know what it's like for a bat to be a bat. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, perhaps we shouldn't go too far into the dis so this discussion <laughs> about um, um, I'm going to be on deep water soon. Taking the ego or a human being or whatever as, as, the, the, um, as the stable factor uh, is, is also from, from the standpoint of these uh, um, guys, these new, new thinking guys like Harman, um, is, is very problematic in a sense that it's both too, uh, too general, too specific in the sense that, um, first of all, you are changing. So uh, you cannot rely on, uh, if, if, I mean, if perception has taken place a, a minute ago, a week ago, mm -hmm. uh, a month ago, and now, it's, it's again with this A is A. So um, there is a certain type of repetition there, so a certain kind of stability, but simultaneously there's a difference. Um, and on, on the other hand, um, this perception is uh, only partly taking place on a conscious level, of course, but there's, we, we are perceiving uh, on much more subtle ways through our body, through our intuition, through our imagination, etc. So that always should be taken into account as well, yeah. I think. Uh, but coming, coming back to this sound objects again, I mean, that is, um, it, it is there and it's especially in the sonic perhaps that, that the relationality becomes much more obvious than trying to have that as a separated thing which you can take out of a context and place in whatever other context. Yeah. Um, I have another question about a title. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and th that's, that's the, the subtitle. Um, yeah, so the aesthetical inquiry and artistic experimentation into the relationships between sound objects and spatial audio. Um, on page 14 of your introduction, you write that your thesis is not the result of an artistic research project. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, <laughs> fi fine with me. <laughs> um, and indeed, uh, the pro focus is primarily, I would say, on technical, technological issues and possibilities and considerations. Um, Although I must immediately admit that I don't see a fundamental distinction so much between art and technology uh, or between artistic and technological decisions even. But um, I, I would like you to, to comment a little bit on, on this subtitle or how do you justify actually then this subtitle, subtitle um, because you call it an aesthetical inquiry and artistic experimentation, and nevertheless you call it, no, it, and it's not an artistic research project. Um, so can you say a little bit more about the aesthetic inquiry? Um, and the reason I'm asking that is that to me it seems that you wanted, you were more interested in discussing technology through art uh, than art and the aesthetics and space through technology. Um, so in other words, I, I missed a bit the artistic and aesthetic reflections, for example, in the case studies. So please 
tell me a little bit why you chose this subtitle. <clears throat> I've chosen this subtitle because aesthetical inquiry to me means inquiry into perception. I think aesthetics is about, uh, is about how you see things. And the artistic experimentation part of it is, as I mentioned in the introduction, that the case studies come about then as a um, as way of making and uh, making as a process of knowing. So the artistic experimentations have been completely integral for me to be able to then kind of like dig further into this idea of the sound object, what spatial audio is, the technological mediations that exist around them, and also just how the artistic projects have shaped all these different ideas that I've presented around space, about the site specific, and about like these kind of the place bound, etc. So I think that is the primary reason why artistic experimentation is part of the subtitle, yet the focus in describing the case studies is not on like the artistic exploration. It's more about what is it that these things actually kind of give me or kind of like afford in the way we describe space and the way we understand space and place and that, those kind of interactions. Hmm. Um, of course, I'm interested in technology and uh, I like working with technology and I, it's kind of like a primary motivation, I think, for anyone who's interested in like sound art or the sonic arts or acousmatic composition or anything. Um, I've tried to not make this into a technical thesis in that sense, that I've tried to tone down as much focus on the technology as I could. Um, I think there's about like 60, 70 pages of like technical stuff that's been edited out of the thesis in that sense. Um, but I've been more interested in seeing like, what is this relationship between the, the perceptual inquiry, between what you can learn, what you can know from doing artistic experimentations, and how can you use technology to achieve these things and what can that tell you conceptually? How can that help you to shape the way you perceive the world around you? How you can use sound to do that? Yeah. Well, talking then about perception um, in relation to, to one of the case studies, uh, case studies uh, the hot pocket uh, case study, this should uh, give an audience the impression of being caught in the, the belly of a huge animal if I'm correct. Um, and of course I've been listening to the sound file with um, great interest, but somehow I didn't, I didn't get that feeling at least at all. Um, mainly because the sounds are, I don't know, perhaps too electronic? I, I, I'm not sure. So could you say something then about the artistic decisions that, that you made there? The problem with the documentation for that case study is that the sound files that are included with the thesis and with the Max Patch do not contain actual recordings from the space. Mm -hmm. So the sound files that are there are the ones that were then that were spatialized and played around, that were like made by a sound designer uh, externally. When I say that it should give the audience the impression of being inside the belly of a large animal, it is due to the visual impression that the artist was trying to create with like transforming the architecture of the museum. Mm. So the Museum of Contemporary Art in Oslo was housed in the old Bank of Norway. Stone floors, terrace floors, marble ceilings, and all that kind of thing. So she, everything was covered. The walls and ceiling, uh, walls and floors were covered in brown carpet. Low lighting and then this like the sound that was moving around. So that was what was supposed to give the impression of being inside this animal. Oh. In the, um, in the sequence of sound events that were going around that is described in the thesis, there is at, on the hour and half hour, there's this breathing that happens, which is not supposed to yeah. emphasize how this is. Um, listening to those sounds of the breathing over computer, lo computer loudspeakers or headphones gives kind of the wrong impression because those were only played via two subwoofers that were kind of placed in this, of the glass ceiling above the mm. audience. So the sound is like this deep rumbling that kind of like shakes the building. Mm -hmm. So I think that is like maybe one of the reasons why you're having trouble kind of kind of perceiving yeah. this uh, this kind of like this kind of sense of being. It's often a problem with uh, sound art installations. Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, yeah, I would like to uh, to go to the 
it, it is somehow, there, I mean, there are many similarities between the questions that uh, Natasha asked and, uh, and my questions. Um, so th this is a question about the relation between chapters two and three uh, and, and the case studies. Um, so, and, and I'm asking that, uh, uh, I'm asking for that relation or to, to say a little bit more about that relation between, because it was not immediately clear to me what the relation was. So, to put it more precise, uh, are chapters two and three, so the one is about sound objects, the other one is about structures, with the exception of 3.6, but that's only for the experts here. Uh, so are they really needed to comprehend the work that you've done uh, in or with these case studies? So from 4.4 onwards. Um, or to put it in another way, how do chapters 2 and 3 interact with 4.4 and further? Or another way of putting it, well, they are, they are all more or less different. What are the case studies giving back to the ideas on the sound object and on the structures? So the topic of chapter two and three. <clears throat> well, my intention was that top chapters two and three, now discussing the sound objects, and perceptions, and then structures, the site-specific and the place-bound in the first two chapters, two and three, would, in a sense, set the stage for chapter four. So to talk about the typical morphology, the morphological criterions of sounds, um, and then on into the case studies. So then hopefully the relationships with sound objects to space, the relationship of sound objects to the site-specific and to the place-bound would have been made clear so that it would be easier for the reader to understand some of the motivations in the case studies. Um, whether or not that is successful, I'm a, you know. Well, the, uh, um, the, this, this whole, the terminology, let's say, of sound object and structures is hardly coming back in the case studies. So, in that sense, I was wondering, like, Hmm. It almost seemed like you had two dissertations, one focusing on the case studies and their exploring in a kind of artistic experimentation. And on the one hand, you had like, you needed perhaps some kind of theoretical framework. Uh, and, but those, for me, looked like, yeah, they were almost separated from one another. So I was, I was constantly looking for, okay, where do you, as the author, make a connection for me as a reader? That might, might have been lost um, when the case studies are not really discussed in like, an artistic manner. They're, only, they're purely like, discussed from like, findings and their relationship to perception and to, uh, and to um, and, like, the, uh, the um, what was the word I just used? The... Um, the knowing that was derived from actually executing the project and how that, influ how that influenced theory. <clears throat> I don't really, that might have been that those kind of like that focus was lost along the way um, for some reason. I couldn't exactly say why, although they've been. So what, what, maybe we, you can reflect on it now then. So what, what, what are the case studies giving back to the theory that you've developed in the previous chapters? Well, the, for example, the first case study, Desolation Rift, gave me a huge amount of insights into the way you can use ambisonics processing to create depth and how you can use that to create these like, spatial relationships where you can perceive something to be far off in the distance, something close to you, and how you can use that to build a sound world. Either if it's composition or if it's in... Um, sound design, or if it has like a pedagogical tool, for example. And I also like brought those kind of insights back into case study number five, when we were experimenting with the students, when they were seated in a circle of speakers, 
they were playing their instrument and then there were sounds from the concert hall coming back to them from the, from, from, like from the, from the room. Mm -hmm. In case study number two, the way that, in retrospect, developed the kind of like the stochastic motion of sound through the room to create this, like these shifting kind of patterns of sound that directly influenced the way that I kind of start to think about and understand the way the tip of morphology can be used as like a spatial uh, mode of analysis. How the gait, how the oscillations, how the mass and different kind of different criteria can interact in the case studies. And then three and four, um, superimposed landscape and city dwellers directly kind of came out of an interest in site-specific work and place and then again influenced the way that I kind of continue to develop those theories. Yeah, so, but that, that seems, uh, at least maybe I understand you, uh, misunderstand you, that that seems to be like the relation from theory to, to the practice. But my question was more like the other way. So what are the case studies giving back? So more than that they are perhaps a kind of illustration of uh, the theories that, that, that you've used. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm, I'm always very much interested in, because they do much more than that. Right? Just, I mean, and it's, it's in, in a way you're, I, I would say, uh, it's, it would even be like doing injustice to, uh, to these uh, case studies to reduce them only to the concepts that, uh, in which you try to squeeze them somehow. So my question is more like, but are they also contributing uh, on their own terms to back to the theories? Are they giving something back to your ideas about sound objects and structures? Um, and in that sense, I, I will just relate it to another question that I had. Did, did you, uh, I mean, it's, it's not a very academic question in that sense, but did you consider the idea of reversing the structure of the thesis, namely to start with or from the case studies, which actually clears uh, or creates, carves out a, a space for you to rethink the concept of sound object in relation to space. So let it come from the artwork that you are making. I haven't, I haven't considered it actually until I, uh, until I read, your, read the evaluation. Um, mm. As a kind of a pedagogical approach to the listener, it was mm. kind of important to then first introduce the background material, then the objects and the structures, and try to build the arguments into the case studies. Um, I do, I would say I have to agree with it. I think that the case studies have, have kind of fallen a little bit perhaps by the wayside and become much more just illustrations of theory than um, as like kind of complete objects in their own right in that sense. Mm. Um, I think perhaps I've toned down the uh, artistic kind of content to them. Um, I don't know why, mm. <laughs> to be honest. I think that's, Perhaps in one sense, it felt like the artistic contribution is kind of like outside the thesis, whilst what they kind of bring to like the theoretical argument is more important. Um, but yes, I think that's, um, hmm. that's probably why. But that being said, the reason they're there is because the theory informs the artwork and the artwork informs the theory. So it's this complete like cyclical um, mm. cyclical mm. relationship where one project starts out from some kind of conceptual idea derived from theory that I've been working on and then in, kind of injects new insights into the theory and the way that that has been further developed. Mm. Do, do you think that, that you could have been more explicit about how actually the, this, uh, one of these case studies or a particular part of these case studies um, affects uh, again how this, uh, how we could think or rethink this sound object and um, the way that we perceive mm -hmm. the environment in relation to the sounds. Well, I've tried to draw a line so that there's, from the discussions and when we move into the tip of morphology and it explains the different criteria, especially like the morphological criterions. And then I tried to bring all those things back into 
discussing the case studies to see how does this relate, how does these motions, how do these spatial presences, how does that relate to this framework and how can we use that kind of to, to think spatially. And then perhaps in a sense I was more just ex expecting the reader to be an expert and then to be able to relate those things back into the discussion oh. on sound effects, <laughs> perhaps. <laughs> Um, but it's, of course, you know, those things could be made much more explicit. Mm, mm. Yeah. I think perhaps I was, uh, maybe it was lost a little bit in the way that I was very eager to show that the typomorphological framework that has its existence purely, purely in a sense, though, as music, used for musical um, analysis, can be used for spatial analysis. Mm. Um, I would like to go back or well, perhaps to continue with, um, you also mentioned in your presentation um, here this, uh, this afternoon, uh, what are we hearing is a recurring mm. question for you. Uh, I would like to relate that to, um, uh, again, in the PDF, it's on page 77, to the work of uh, Kiel Samkopf, uh, which you are mentioning there. Um, and I'm quoting you here. Uh, this work, yeah, let me try to, exp to, to say which work it is, Mora Dalen Walk. Mora Dalen Walk, yes. Yeah. Um, it's a record featuring recordings of walking. The recordings are of someone, presumably the composer, walking in different terrains of the mountains. This is a sonic portrait of place through an interaction with the material substances found on site. So that's end of quote. Um, so, um, you connect this, um, this, this, when you discuss this work of Zamkov, you connect this to your re redefinition of reduced listening as a temporal suspension of oral information in order to listen to sounds for themselves. Um, yeah, a reduced listening, perhaps we could say that with Gadamer, that's an objective listening almost. So, um, so again, here you come back to this, uh, or, or I come back at least to this idea that regarding sound or the sound object through reduced listening as temporarily removed from the context. And as I said before, that seems to me impossible from an ecological or post-structural or new materialist, but also from Samkov's uh, standpoint. And that's, where, that's why I was triggered why you mentioned exactly that example when you talk about this reduced listening as temporarily talking about the sounds for themselves. Um, because it, it's very clear in your description of the work that you always hear much more than the sound itself uh, and perhaps also the sound source. You hear the interaction and that's actually what, 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 what you, how you're quoting Zamkov as well. So you're, you're hearing his footsteps or whatever, who, whoever it is, in relation to the surfaces on which he walks or somebody walks. So it is all, and, and I mean, much more than the surfaces, also maybe the, 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 the circumstances of the weather or whether it's raining or not, or in, in, if, if there is any trees or, or plants around or what, I mean, you name it, or the, or the kind of boots that, that they are wearing or other clothes or, I mean, any, anything. So in that sense, I, I, I will ask you the question, what are you hearing? Good question. <laughs> um, well, first of all, I have to say that there is no redefinition of reduced listening in the thesis. The way that I present reduced listening and the way I discuss it kind of is in this very traditional Schifferian manner. Um, but then that becomes interesting when listening to this rec record or listening to these different sounds because as I talked about with uh, Natasha is that it all depends on your intentional focus of what you are listening to. So you can listen to it 
as a record of somebody walking in a mountain landscape on different, different surfaces. Or you can choose to focus intentionally on the different qualities of grass or of gravel, the proximity of the microphone to where the person is standing. Is there sounds of clothes? Is there a human presence? Or is there some kind of like an idea of trying to present nature as for itself? And I think that is what I'm trying to get at when I'm just describing, this, describing this record, is that although, yes, you can listen to it purely for its environmental sound, there's also so many other layers that you can listen into. You can listen into the, the production of it, how it's mixed, how if there's kind of a noise in the background from, from the wind, from birds, or from the microphones themselves. So there are all these different layers of perception that you can project into it. And that is why, that's what I say, that's how we use reduced listening, to focus in on those very small kind of parts of, yeah. of an, with an intentional focus. I, I agree uh, with you that, that, of course, when we hear um, such a record, or, or if we experience it in uh, our daily environment, uh, we can, of course, at least try to concentrate and to isolate one, one aspect, um, which is at that moment perhaps the most meaningful or interesting for us. But uh, I think what we are hearing is much more than what Schaeffer or any other person defending this reduced listening uh, could have thought of or has been thinking of. So we are, we are hearing much more than that. Um, and so, so in, in that sense, I'm, I'm coming back to this uh, idea of, of um, the extension of the sound object in it's always in relation mm -hmm. to uh, the environment or and and it's it's i mean this environment is it is in fact also endless to a certain extent Absolutely. but the sound is defined mm -hmm. by the other agents that are present there and we are able to hear that so we are and that doesn't have to be like an attentive lesson or like a conscious perception, but it is part of our listening experience. Mm -hmm. I agree. Absolutely. Okay, that, and then... But, but, but yeah. you can still, regardless of like the totality of where this kind of record exists and like all the context that it can exist in, you can still choose to disregard parts of it and focus on very, very specific features. Yeah, but th th that, you that's why... You can also listen to it from an ecological perspective and then listen to what is, you know, what is the mountain, what is like, the mountain mm. being, what, is, uh, what, what, what do all these different layers contribute to it? Mm. And then you, um, the kind of, but it gives you access to then to be able to understand or to penetrate further into what meaning or significance the record in itself can have. And I think... That is also something that comes out of this intentional focused listening to the individual sounds, to the individual tracks. Yeah. Yes, I, I, I agree. I, yeah, I was just puzzled why you mentioned this example of Zamkov. Uh, where because it's... I love it. <laughs> yeah, okay, that's a very good reason. Uh, um, that's the best reason, actually. Why would you deal with music or sound that you don't like and um, spend time with it. Uh, but um, still, I wonder why it is there in this specific part of your thesis where you talk spe specifically about reduced listening, whereas you make clear in the way you describe Zamkov piece that it is about rela relationality. So that, that is where my... Well, not my problem is, but where I got curious. But it's not presented in isolation, though. It's presented with two other musical examples as mm -hmm. well, if I remember correctly. I don't have the text in front of me. Um, and it does... Um, it's presented along with... I don't know, I'll have to check the, check the document. It's um, page 77. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. It's 
It's presented along with two other pieces of work. One Kitch Beach Sandwalk that was presented earlier today and a sand map of the Hudson River. And the intention is not necessarily to present Mogadal Walk kind of singularly, but in relationship to these two other works as different ways of viewing the site specific and the place band. There are different ways that we can understand this kind of relationship to, um, to nature and to the environment. So a sand map of the Hudson River by Ania Lockwood traces the Hudson River from its beginning to the Atlantic Ocean. Yep. And it kind of deals directly with these like morphological changes to the sound of the river as it passes through the landscape. Kate Speed Sandwalk, as I said earlier today, like, uses the technological means available in soundscape studies to manipulate how the listener can, can kind of access this one spot on the beach. At one point, um, she mixes the sound of the barnacles and then fades it into a concrete yeah. piage by Sanakis. And then that is like the context that Moadan Walk is presented in, saying like, here are three different uh, musical uh, records or pieces that examine and kind of penetrate the ideas of the site-specific in three different manners using different techniques, different environments, and different intentions, in that sense. Okay, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah. What is, according to you, the, the most important achievement of this project? What is your most important contribution to knowledge? Or to put it differently, how can others benefit from your work? And who are these others? So for whom is it meant? Um. <clears throat> I think its contribution is to try to bring together a multitude of different disciplines and ideas and thoughts and how this can be exploited to work kind of for artists and for sound designers, for sound installation artists and for researchers, how they can help to shape kind of like their understanding of sound and of space and the relationships between them and how that extends outwards from just this like some kind of a, an abstracted idea of space as in terms of spatialization and loudspeaker mediation, but outside into these like place-bound contexts and how they can then hopefully, after reading the thesis, um, gain some new tools in the way that they can kind of analyze and interrogate those relationships. So that, that, that means that uh, it is, is then true that uh, for you, these case studies are in fact the most crucial part of your thesis? No, I don't think so. I think the theory is the most important part of it, but I think the case studies are important practical illustrations of those ideas. So, um, um, yeah. well, so, so, so let, let's, I, I thought you said that, uh, that your main audience are sound artists, no? Sound artists, composers. Yeah. yeah. So what, 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 how, how could they, how would they benefit from, from the first chapters then? Well, what would they, what, what, how, could that contribute to their knowledge either for practical reasons or, I mean, yeah, for practical reasons mainly? Well, as I said in the trial lecture, then the, how the ideas of Schaeffer and Schaeffer kind of filter down through a multitude of different practices. Mm -hmm. Say, you can come for the music, but then you can stay for the theory. So hopefully the theory will help artists and sound, and sound artists, etc., to continue to shape the way that they work with space and the way they work with sound in those kind of contexts. Mm. Because I think the theoretical, um, the theoretical expositions or the expose is, is, is integral to like the kind of like continued understanding of it. If not, if you take away the theory, then it just becomes, or if the sound, uh, the, the case studies were presented isolated or by themselves, it would be much more of a kind of artistic, but also of a very technical sense mm. and then being devoid of that theory. So, uh, uh, which would make perhaps the circle round. Um, could you then just in, in, in one or two sentences describe um, what sound artists and composers could learn from 
the more theoretical parts of your thesis that they could not have learned by going to the sources, to the prime sources, so to Schaeffer and Schaeffer themselves. Well, in, in all modesty. <laughs> well, you don't have to be modest. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think after having read this, that sound artists and composers can learn how to evaluate space through the idea of the sound object. They can find kind of the expansion that I've tried to make of the sound object and how it relates to more than just the interior or the sound or like the sound itself. That is an avenue that can open up a lot of new ways of exploration. And I think the way that these kind of different theories and different insights are drawn together is not necessarily fine found in the original text. That's why I'm drawing together all these different strands to try to like build up this argument. The sound <laughs> object is this multidimensional unit or entity or feature or thing that we can then extend this further into space and we can use that to start understanding much more that is kind of outside of just the sound or the way that you would isolate it and listen to it. Yeah. Well, as I said, well, with this answer, the circle is round as far as I'm concerned. So um, if there are any questions from the audience, <laughs> then this is a time to ask. Or am I now taking your position here? <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Ulf, uh, Natasha. Uh